for the for the hematology uh, content, we'll be discussing very few items actually. It should be pretty straightforward. I've eliminated a lot of the content to give you just you know, the basics um, and what you really need. So it's really at, at a minimum already. So um, we'll be discussing some, some anemias, uh, you know, iron deficiency anemia, and uh, we'll be discussing um, anemia in general. So I'll give you a little bit of that background um, for before you come to class. We'll be discussing uh, sickle cell disease, and I know this is review, for, it should be review for most of you. This is something that's in the block two content. And we're just gonna do a little review on that content and uh, talk about taking care of a child uh, with sickle cell disease and things that are different. So it'll be a little bit of a refresher for you. And then we'll, we'll be discussing uh, hemophilia types A and B. And again, this should be review for some of you from block two, um, but it is something that is worth a mention. So we'll be reviewing a little bit of that content as well. Okay, to be most successful with uh, the hematology uh, content we'll be going over is just in understanding some of the basics about blood, what makes up the blood. So I'm not going to give you a whole anatomy physiology uh, you know, lecture here. If you need to brush up on your anatomy and physiology, uh, there are two ways you can do that. One, you can just you know, bust out your A&P book or your A&P uh, resources and do a little update on that. You can also look at the review pieces in the front of uh, the hematology chapter in your textbook, and it'll you give you a little bit of recap and review and some great photos. Um, or if you have some other type of resource, feel free to use that. But we talk a lot about uh, the CBC when we have a child with um, a hematologic uh, you know, condition or problem. So it's, un it's important to understand what the CBC means and what it's telling us. So when we're looking within the CBC, we're looking at the red blood cells. So those are, again, the cells that carry the oxygen that you breathe from the lungs to all parts of your body. So that this is how we oxygenate your organs, your skin, all the cells within your body. So they're pretty essential, I would say. The white blood cells, or the WBCs, help fight infection. So we're not gonna be talking about those a whole lot in this section, um, but you, I mean, you do need to understand um, what they do for us. Uh, the platelets help to make scabs form over the hurt area. So when we have an injury to the skin, the platelets help in uh, the formation of clotting. Um, they work in conjunction with the clotting factors and uh, you know the other items in the liquid portion of the blood, uh, which is your plasma. So that's the liquid portion of the blood, which has the clotting factors that help make bleeding stop. So you can have all the platelets in the world and if you don't have the clotting factors, clotting is not going to happen. You can have all the clotting factor in the world, but without without the platelets, the you know clotting is not going to happen correctly. So those are we need to have both of those things in place for uh, clotting, for scabbing, you know, for healing to take place. Just some general information about uh, you know the blood and anemias when we're talking about kids. The way we're going to narrow down and figure out what is going on with this child, why they're having an issue, um, are based on uh, you know the patient's history. So we're going to get some background on what's been going on with them and, and conduct a physical exam in addition to the lab work that'll really give us the very key pieces of information. What you'll find um, in looking at the h &P exam on a child with a hematologic problem is many times the parents will report a lack of energy. They may report in looking at their nutrition. Um, when we look at their food diaries, we'll find out that they're not getting um, enough iron. They're not, they don't have uh, good sources of protein in their diet. They may com uh, complain of a history of frequent infections and poor healing, things like that. We may also see from them, uh, they'll report th uh, that bleeding and bruising is difficult, to, uh, is difficult to control. So they'll bruise very easily. Um, cuts and scrapes will bleed more than they should. A bloody nose won't stop bleeding very quickly or um, will bleed excessively.
Okay, so anemia is the most common hematologic disorder of childhood. Um, any patient with anemia, what that basically means, it doesn't, at this point we're not talking about the causes, but the end result of the anemia, whatever the problem is, so we have either a decrease in the number of red blood cells or uh, the hemoglobin level or concentration is below normal. This results in, um, the, in a decrease you know, oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. So what does that mean? It means we're going to have not enough blood going out to body tissues, to fingers and toes and to the body organs and all the places that need oxygen. If the anemia, if the anemia has occurred or um, has you know, happened solely over time, then the body is going to adapt. So we'll see kids who have adapted so well to their anemia that we're not especially concerned about it um, until we notice that we now have a major problem because they're so good at adapting. So this chart provides a nice little representation of um, the three main ways that we can um, we can have anemia. So the green boxes are those um, are the type of anemia from a decrease in red blood cell production. So you see the signs and symptoms there within that box, and then below that the causes. So those within the nutritional deficiency category, like your iron deficiency anemia, and then those. Um, as a result of bone marrow failure. So that would be like your aplastic anemia, um, your ALL, CMV, things like that. Then in the yellow box, you see the types of anemia um, from an increase in red blood cell loss. Um, so again, you see the symptoms in that top box and then below that, those are gonna be related to acute blood loss. So it could be severe nosebleeds or hemophilia, all kinds of things. And then the blue boxes over on the right, those, um, are the things that will lead to an increase in red blood cell destruction. So again, you see the symptoms there, which you're aware of what we see, um, and then, then the causes below that. How does anemia affect the circulatory system? In a couple of different ways. First, is it leads uh, to hemodilution. If you think about uh, the definition of anemia, we have a decrease in the number of red blood cells or the concentration below normal. So we still have some probably, but there aren't as many. And if we take the big chunks out of the blood, it leads to much a much uh, thinner blood. The thinner the blood is, the easier it's going to move through the vasculatory system. This leads to a decrease in peripheral resistance, meaning the blood flow is moving so rapidly through the vascular system that um, there's very little resistance in uh, you know, the peripheral parts of the body. Also, we have an increase um, in cardiac circulation um, and turbulence because of the hemodilution and the resistance change. Um, the blood is able, because it's moving through so quickly, it can lead to an increase in turbulence, meaning it's moving through so rapidly um, that it, it's no longer good for the body. It may lead to a murmur in some cases because the blood is moving so fast, and it may also lead uh, to cardiac failure. So these are two things we you know, don't want to happen if we can avoid them. Cyanosis is typically not going to be seen. Uh, you know, with anemia. There are other conditions where it would be, but not typically with, with anemias. It can lead to growth retardation. Think about what your body needs for growth. We talk, you know, we talk about like you know, iron and good nutrition and all these things that we need for growth and for healing. So if we don't have enough you know, red blood cells, if they're not able to deliver enough oxygen to the body tissues, the body tissues aren't going to have everything that they need to grow. So that can be a huge issue for children where we don't really worry about that piece with adults, right? Um, it also can lead to a delay um, in sexual maturity, meaning they go into puberty late, they don't go into puberty um, you know, for a very, very, very long time. So we can see these kids potentially not you know, hitting uh, puberty milestones when we expect them to.
So what do we do about anemia? So again, we'll talk about the specific types of anemias in class, but as a general rule, we want to treat the underlying cause. If they have iron deficiency anemia, what are we going to do? Yes, we're going to give them iron. It's not rocket science. If they have a clotting problem, we're going to try to you know, correct that. So whatever's going on uh, in you know, the hematologic system, we're going to try to fix it. So uh, for... Um, if it's a deficiency anemia, like I mentioned, you know, iron deficiency anemia is a good example. We're going to provide them with, with nutritional intervention. We're going to replace what it is they're not getting. Um, for, like, for sickle cell disease, we kind of look at other things, but it's really uh, the supportive care. We can't cure it. We can't make it go away. But what we can do is everything we need to support them through until they recover from the exacerbation. So... Uh, a supportive care includes many other things, but the top three in terms of importance are the IV fluids, so making sure they're well hydrated, providing them with oxygen. So if we don't have enough RBCs or they're abnormal, giving them oxygen is just going to maximize the number of red blood cells that we're able to oxygenate. And then bed rest. So we want them to rest. We don't want them to overexert themselves. We want to make sure that... Um, that they're staying um, in the best health that they can, and we're maximizing the amount of oxygen going to body tissues and organs instead of exerting it with activity. So from a nursing care perspective, when you're taking care of a patient who has a hematologic condition, Think about the fact that they're going to need lab work. That's going to be a huge, huge part of their management and treatment. So it's important from a nursing perspective that we're preparing those kids and their families for the lab test. Why is it really necessary that we poke the child again? So they have to understand why the test is important, making sure that we have a, um, a person of support with the child during the procedures, we need to allow the child to play with equipment or to practice on a doll uh, prior to having the procedure performed. We want to have the child uh, participate in, in, um, in some way if possible. Now, you know, well, you know, obviously they're not going to be able to complete the blood draw on their own, but we'll be able um, to help them feel a part of you know, the process. We're going to absolutely take advantage of our topical anesthetics, so our J-tips and Emla cream. Uh, the LMX, all of those things, the Freezy Spray, we're going to really take advantage of those because we know they're going to be getting frequent lab work and we want to make sure that um, that we're you know, doing it in a way that's the least traumatic for them. You know, remember you know, you know, atraumatic care that we talked about a while ago. We also want to decrease their oxygen demands. So especially like for sickle cell, you know, more so, we want to really... Um, be aware of what their child level is and uh, to minimize the excessive demands on their body. So they're not going to be running around the unit, you know, playing around. They're going to be resting and relaxing and doing quiet activities like board games and, you know, you know, puzzles and things like that. Many of these kids with a hematologic uh, condition, anemia, they um, are going to be at risk for infection because of, again, the lack of oxygen to body tissues and such, they, you know, their, um, you know, their body tissues aren't uh, fully functional. They're not as strong as they would be. So if they do get sick, they tend to get a little sicker or get sick a little faster and not be able to fight it as well. And it's important that we also provide uh, some family support. So if they're going to the clinic all the time, that can be overwhelming. Um, if one child is getting all of the attention within the family. Um, that's going to affect the other children. Um, maybe the condition is so severe that the child can't participate in normal activities. There are lots of ways um, that that can be a factor and a concern. So just you know, keep that in mind um, as you meet and are taking care of these patients you know, with these you know, types of conditions. Iron deficiency anemia is pretty straightforward. Um, you've learned it before, so we're just going to do a little bit of review here. 
It's caused by an inadequate supply of dietary iron. This is generally considered to be preventable, um, and we can prevent it uh, through a few different um, uh, dietary changes. So some things to remember is that now most of the, the baby cereals and formulas and even the big kid cereals are now iron fortified. So that's being added um, to those foods. Um, keep in mind that the newborn has their iron source from the mother um, for their first five to six months of life. This is assuming um, that, that the baby is normal. So generally speaking, when a newborn comes into the world, we don't have to worry about, about iron deficiency for about five to six months. Um, there, are, uh, there are special needs for premature infants because they didn't have time to build those iron stores. So your premature infant, your non-full-term infant, um, didn't have a chance to build those iron stores at the end of pregnancy. That's when these babies um, are building up their iron stores. It's that last trimester. So those that are premature, we know are already right out of the gate, they're going to be um, at, at greater risk for iron deficiency anemia. So they're going to need a supplement. And then children between 12 and 36 months are especially at risk. And if you think about what changes in children um, at this time or at this age, um, think about what happens, for those of you with children, um, what happens around 12 months in terms of their dietary changes. One of the biggest changes at that age is we go from uh, formula to table milk or um or from breastfeeding to milk in, um, in many cases. So not that we can't continue to breastfeed, but a lot of times at a year of age, we'll wean them from formula or breast milk and move them on uh, to cow's milk. So um, we know that once they start to consume more milk in their diet, that because milk is not very high in iron, that unless we're giving them plenty of iron in like in other sources, they're not going to be getting enough. Um, and then um, our adolescents are at risk just because of the amount of growth that we see in the adolescent years and because of their poor eating habits. You already should know what we do for iron deficiency anemia, but I'm going to review with you anyway. So for therapeutic management, we're going to increase the amount of iron that the child receives. So uh, the dietary iron is the best way to increase their iron intake. Um, uh, um, and ferrous iron is best. And we're also going to, along with that iron supplement, make sure they're getting plenty of vitamin C. And you know exactly why that's going to happen too. Yes, it's because vitamin C increases the absorption of iron. In terms of your nursing care management, um, some things, of course, that we can do, making sure that babies have an iron-fortified formula or cereal, um, or we're going to start them on iron drops at five months of age if they're breastfed. So you're making sure that we've got um, these babies on the right diet and that they're getting the iron that they need. If we do need to provide with, uh, them with an iron supplementation, we can give it orally. Um, it's important to remember that the oral iron may stain their teeth. It's kind of a dark greenish black color so we need to give it if they're older we could use a straw but personally I can't imagine a single child that would drink any liquid iron through a straw it does not taste good so ideally um, a medicine dropper or syringe is going to be best and we're going to squirt that iron supplement to the back of their throat um, so one they're not going to taste it as much hopefully and two it's less likely to stain the teeth and if it does it will affect the back teeth not the front teeth and then we need to teach parents that with an oral iron supplement that they're going to see a change in their child's stool, that they're going to turn kind of a tarry green or black color, and that this is normal and expected because the last thing we want is for parents to flip out over that. If we're giving it IM, um, it's important to remember to give it using the Z-Track method. It's given deep IM and you never massage the site. Um, in addition to that, because we're talking about children, the maximum you can give is one milliliter in one site. Just a quick review of sickle cell anemia. Um, remember that it's a hereditary disease. It is an autosomal recessive trait. 40% um, um, of, of, of the native African population are carriers. 
And if both parents have the trait, each offspring will have a 1 in 4 or 25% chance of having the disease. We see it primarily in African Americans. The occurrence is, in about, um, is about 1 in 375 African American infants born in the U.S. Um, 1 in 12 will have, a, will have the sickle cell trait, but not the disease. And we occasionally see it in people um, of Mediterranean descent, South American, Arabian, and East Indian descent. Pathophysiology review. What happens in sickle cell anemia is, um, is obstruction and destruction um, of red blood cells. So um, one of the components is we have a partial or complete replacement of normal hemoglobin with the abnormal hemoglobin S. Um, what happens um, when the normal hemoglobin is replaced with hemoglobin S it um, changes the shape of the red blood cell. It takes on that sickle shape, and it, it, it essentially makes the red blood cell um, so that it doesn't function properly. Then these cells, because of their shape, um, uh, they're rigid and sickled, they're going to get caught up in the microvasculature. So they will actually obstruct the capillary blood flow, causing obstruction. This leads to hypoxia, leads to stasis of blood with enlargement of blood vessels, it leads to infarction with ischemia and destruction, and eventually replacement with fibrous tissue scarring. That's kind of the short and sweet in a nutshell review. Sickle cell anemia can cause many different complications within the body, can cause strokes, uh, a retinopathy, blindness, hematuria, uh, splenomegaly, which um, can lead to splenic sequestration. Um, we can see the uh, avascular necrosis of the hip, uh, priapism. I mean, the list goes on and on, but that gives you kind of an idea. It affects many, many body systems. There is no cure um, except for possibly a bone marrow or stem cell transplant. There's a lot of research being done. Um, so we mainly are going to do supportive care, um, which is going to focus on preventing sickling episodes. Uh, kids um, are prone to frequent bacterial infections, um, and these occur because of immunocompromise. Bacterial infection is the leading cause of death in young children with sickle cell disease. So it's a very real concern. Um, we also see strokes in 5 to 10% of children with the disease. So, we, I mean, we think of strokes as, um, as a danger for, you know, for older adults uh, with cardiovascular disease, but um, you know, we have to remember that these children are also at risk for stroke. Precipitating factors for sickle cell crisis include uh, essentially anything that increases the body's need for oxygen or alters the transport of oxygen. This includes uh, trauma, infection or fever, physical or emotional stress, um, increased blood viscosity or thickness caused uh, um, essentially by dehydration and can be caused by other things, uh, hypoxia, and temperature extremes. We even see uh, 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 changes in climate or changes in elevation, um, you know, can also contribute. Uh, sickle cell crises um, are acute exacerbations that vary in severity and frequency. So not every child with sickle cell disease has the same, uh, the same presentation. Um, so we can have uh, vaso-occlusive thrombotic, which is the most common type of crisis. These are very painful. These are where we have a stasis of blood, so the blood is kind of obstructed, uh, clumps in the microcirculation. It leads to decrease in oxygen to those tissues, and it can actually result in the death of those cells. Signs of this type of, um, of, of, this type of cri crisis include fever, pain, and tissue engorgement.
One of the most concerning complications um, of the vaso-occlusive thrombotic crisis is the splenic sequestration. This is where blood pools in the liver and spleen and um, it results in not enough blood out in the rest of the body and the rest of the circulation. This is a life-threatening condition and death can occur within hours. Um, so what we see is um, signs um, of profound anemia uh, followed by weakness, uh, hypovolemia, and shock. So any child with sickle cell disease or in sickle cell crisis who presents with symptoms that look like shock, we, we need to have them evaluated um, to see if blood is pooling in the liver and spleen immediately. Sickle cell disease is diagnosed through the cord blood in newborns um, if, if a sample is taken. Um, it can also um, be caught on the newborn screen, which is now done in all 50 states. So no matter which state you live in, um, with the newborn screen, they will test for sickle cell. We can do genetic testing in advance to identify carriers and to identify children who have the disease. Um, they uh, can also do a couple of tests on the blood itself, like electrophoresis. Um, that's the same process that they use um, uh, to analyze DNA. Um, may, it, it, uh, it, it also may be diagnosed as a toddler after acute respiratory or GI infection. So uh, this would be more concerning for children who moved to the U.S. and maybe didn't have the newborn screen done. Um, you know, we may not know they have it until something happens, they get sick, have, have um, um, a major respiratory or GI illness, um, and have some complications along with that, and it triggers a sickle cell crisis, and then it's going to be picked up at that point. Medical management for sickle cell disease is focused on preventing sickling and treating the medical emergencies of sickle cell disease, so all the complications that come with it. So what we're going to do for these kids is aggressively treat infection. Um, they may end up on uh, uh, some prophylactic antibiotics. Um, can last from two months to five years to reduce the risk of infection. We're going to monitor their, uh, their retic count regularly to evaluate bone marrow function. Um, they may get blood transfusions. Um, if these are given early in a crisis, it can reduce the amount of ischemia that we see. So, um, and that actually um, was a very common treatment. I don't think we see that quite as frequently now, but it still is done. Uh, frequent transfusion um, is going to increase um, the iron stores in tissues. So we're going to have a buildup of iron in tissues. Um, so that will also have to be uh, counteracted. So we're going to actually do what's called the iron chelation treatments. Um, and so the furoxamine, that medication that we use, um, will actually bind to the iron and allow it to be excreted. So this will protect um, the child from having that, uh, that iron buildup in their tissues. And we can also give medication, um, the hydroxyurea. You should have learned about this when you learned about sickle cell disease prior. What this does is it increases the fetal hemoglobin, so the hemoglobin F, which is going to develop into normal hemoglobin. Um, so this can help uh, to block or stop the effects um, of sickle cell disease and limit uh, the hemoglobin S. Um, it is important to remember that this drug is cytotoxic, so the way that it's handled and administered um, needs to be done with care. Okay, our main focus in treatment, there are kind of our top four things that we're going to do are pain management, because it's extremely painful from the vasal occlusion, oxygen therapy, hydration, so this can be done orally or IV, it doesn't matter as long as they're getting hydrated, uh, you know, either method is okay, and rest. We want to minimize their energy expenditure and their oxygen consumption, um, and getting enough rest will help with this. In addition to those items, we also want to um, stay on top of electrolyte replacement. Um, so they uh, the hypoxia that comes along with with a crisis 
can result in metabolic acidosis and this is going to in turn cause more sickling. So making sure that our electrolytes are balanced and that we're preventing uh, that metabolic acidosis will help to minimize uh, the amount of sickling that they have in a crisis. Uh, blood replacement, we already talked about this. This will help to treat the anemia and reduce the viscosity of blood. And then lastly, uh, the antibiotic therapy. So this will allow us to treat any existing infection. So anytime we have a child with sickle cell disease who presents with a high fever, um, we need to be pretty on top of things and start, um, start treating them with antibiotics right away so that we um, you know, can minimize the chances of the infection causing a major crisis or making the crisis worse. So nursing care management um, is also going to include monitoring the child's growth and watching for failure to thrive. These are clues that the child is not, um, is not healthy enough or that their sickle cell disease um, is a little bit more severe. Um, this, uh, it's important to do a careful multi-system assessment. Um, I showed you kind of, uh, that picture of the child's body and all the different areas that are affected by sickle cell disease. So it's important to do a really good assessment and pick up on it, um, like on any of those problems. We want to assess their pain and treat that pain effectively. We want to monitor or observe for the presence of inflammation, infection, and or dehydration. Um, that way we can intervene right away. We're going to carefully monitor for signs of shock. Again, this is going to give us a clue that maybe um, the child is experiencing a splenic sequestration. We want to treat the child normally in every other way that we can um, and try to contribute to their ability to be a normal kid and do normal kid things. And lastly, we need to do a really good job in assessing for complications. So watching for blood in the urine or um, any of those symptoms that would indicate that they are experiencing um, complications of sickle cell disease. In meeting the psychosocial needs of the child, we want to make sure that they have effective coping mechanisms um, and that if they don't, uh, we're helping them to establish means of coping. Um, we can provide support um, with genetic counseling. We want to address their financial needs, make sure that they, if they have insurance, that, um, that it's covering everything that they need, and if not, finding resources to help them. We want to monitor uh, parents and other caregivers for caregiver role strain, um, especially if the child has pretty severe sickle cell disease. This can be really draining on caregivers. We want to help support the family as they learn to live and cope with, um, with, uh, with chronic illness within the family. It can be really overwhelming. It can take attention away from siblings. Lots of issues um, that, that will need to be addressed in the family. And then tons of education. We want to teach about the importance of early intervention, um, how to recognize signs and symptoms, and what family can do to prevent a sickle cell crisis from occurring. Hemophilia is a group of hereditary bleeding disorders that result from deficiencies of specific clotting factors. So the type of hemophilia um, that someone has is dependent on which clotting factor uh, they're having a problem with or deficient. It is an X-linked recessive gene, which means that it's going to affect only boys. And the incidence is about 1 in 5,000 male births. So females may be the carriers but will not actually uh, have the disease. And identification of the specific factor that is deficient allows for definitive treatment. So we need to know which factor is the problem so we can replace it. Hemophilia A is, um, is also known as classic hemophilia. So this is, you know, when people say, I know someone with hemophilia, they're usually referring to type A. Um, and this type of hemophilia has a deficiency of factor 8, um, and it accounts for about 85% of cases of hemophilia. 
And hemophilia B is also known as, um, um, as Christmas disease. This was named um, not, not because it was discovered around Christmas, but that's actually the name of the person who discovered it. Um, it's caused by a deficiency of factor nine and accounts for 10 to 15 percent of cases of hemophilia. Um, there are others that are much less common, so we're only going to focus on A and B. Um, and if you have trouble remembering them, what I usually like to remember is um, A comes before B, 8 comes before 9. So A and 8 go together, B and 9 go together. So that may or may not help you to remember that. Manifestations of hemophilia will vary a little bit from person to person. Uh, the bleeding tendencies can range from mild all the way to very severe. Um, so typically what we see in children um, is bruising, nosebleeds, sometimes blood and urine, and of course then when there's any cut or injury, we'll, you know, we'll see excessive bleeding. The degree of bleeding that we're going to see in each child with hemophilia depends on the amount of clotting factor and the severity of the injury. So we have a bigger cut, it's, it, it's obviously going to bleed more than something small. Um, but not everyone has the same level of deficiency of clotting factor, so that um, needs to be taken into account. Symptoms may not occur in children until about six months of age. Um, and that's because if you think about um, the normal growth and development of children, they only start becoming mobile around six months of age. They now are able to roll, roll over. Um, they're getting ready to crawl. Um, so it's at this point when they roll over and those mobility um, skills um, are mastered that we sometimes see injuries because they'll start falling and get cuts and bruises and such as they start moving around more. The other thing that we commonly see um, um, is hemarthrosis, and that is bleeding into the joint spaces. Um, we primarily are going to see this in the knee, the ankle, and the elbow, and this leads to problems with mobility. So that's an area that we really don't want to see bleeding, but we want to be on the lookout for. Hemophilia can be diagnosed uh, through an amniocentesis during pregnancy. If we know that, um, that we need to check for it, then they'll go ahead and do testing for it. We can also do genetic testing of family members to identify who is and who isn't a carrier. Um, and this can help like with family planning, um, you know, whether or not we need to refer them to a geneticist before becoming pregnant, that type of thing. Uh, the diagnosis may be made on basis of history, some lab tests, and examination. So we don't necessarily need to do an amnio, you know, on every child um, unless there's a concern. Um, in terms of labs, what we're going to see in these children are low levers, sorry, low levels of factor eight or factor nine, and we're also going to do PTT. Um, we're going to look at the, you know, obviously their bleeding times. So what will be normal will be their platelet count, their PT, and fibrinogen, because those parts of, of the process of clotting are not malfunctioning. It's because of the factor eight or nine that, that we're having a problem. So the PTT will be off, you know, it'll take longer um, for them to clot, but when we look at platelets and fibrinogen and all that, those things will be normal. Medical management of hemophilia is going to focus on, um, on limiting bleeding and, um, and preventing complications. So potential complications that are, can occur in the patient with hemophilia include hemorrhage, uh, transfusion reactions because they're going to need, they're more likely to need blood transfusions as treatment, shock, and death. So clearly we want to avoid those things. Um, that can be done through, uh, through medication. Uh, so desmopressin is what you want to remember. The desmopressin is a generic name, so of course that's what you'll see on NCLEX. It's sold under the brand name of DDAVP, which is uh, you know desmopressin acetate something something. So that's not really important. Just remember the desmopressin, but you may see it referred to um, as DDAVP. This is a medication that can be given IV or via nasal spray for these children. And what it's gonna do is cause two to four times increase in factor eight activity. So this is 
you know, obviously then going to be used for, uh, for your hemophilia A patients. Um, and it can be helpful for those with mild hemophilia. This will not be very effective in those with very severe disease. The other thing we can do is replacing the missing clotting factors. So we can give them factor eight or nine to help with that. Um, we can treat with corticosteroids. The corticosteroids are going to be helpful um, in managing the hemarthrosis, so the bleeding into the joint spaces. That will help with inflammation and discomfort that's associated with that. The other thing that we can obviously do then is transfusions. I mentioned that up at the top, the potential for reactions. So, um, and it used to be back in the 80s that was really the only treatment. So these children were, um, were receiving multiple blood transfusions to help... Um, you know, after bleeding incidents and replacing those clotting factors to buy them time. So, um, you know, 30 years ago, it wasn't uncommon for these children to also, uh, you know, test positive for HIV and progress to AIDS. I actually knew someone when I was in, I think it was about fifth grade, um, who, who had AIDS, who then died of that, but he was receiving blood transfusions as a result of hemophilia. So super tragic. Since um, we become really good um, at testing blood. It's so much safer now. And we've got these other treatments that can help as well. This isn't seen as frequently as it used to be. There is no cure for hemophilia. Um, so historically, most died by the age of five. So it was very uncommon for them to live a really, really long time because because they'd have some type of fall or injury that would lead to a major bleeding episode and they would die. Um, so, But now, mild to moderate hemophilia patients live near normal lives. So they live really good lives, um, have good quality, um, you know, so we don't have to worry about them quite as much as we used to. Um, and some exciting things on the horizon, they're um, they're doing a lot of testing um, and looking at gene therapy as a possible future treatment. Um, so these infused carrier organisms um, can act on and, uh, the target cells to promote the manufacturing of the clotting factor that you know they're deficient in. So that's kind of exciting. So you kind of want to keep your ear out as your career progresses, um, but you'll hear more about this um, in the next few years, I'm sure. Some of the important nursing interventions for you to remember um, for these patients is that they're going to need uh, to be closely supervised. We need to make sure that they're playing in a safe environment um, and that we're really aware of the risk for injury. They're going to need uh, to have dental procedures done in a controlled situation, um, shave only with an electric razor. Uh, for any minor injuries with just some superficial bleeding, we're going to apply pressure for at least 15 minutes and ice to vasoconstrict. And then if significant bleeding occurs, they're going to need a um, transfusion for factor replacement. So anything really significant, we need to be uh, more aggressive then with treatment. As the nurse who's caring for this patient, the focus is going to be on preventing bleeding and recognizing signs and symptoms of bleeding. So we want to be on the lookout for these patients who are presenting with excessive bruising or when they have falls. We need to do a really good assessment um, so that we can identify when we have an issue. Um, we also want to prevent the crippling effects of bleeding into the joint spaces. So. Um, during these episodes of bleeding into the joints, we want to elevate and immobilize the joint. We're going to ice the joints, provide them with analgesics. Once the, uh, the bleeding stops, we're going to do range of motion exercises, and this will help to prevent stiffness and contractures. Um, they'll likely need some physical therapy. And um, we want to educate them on like unhealthy eating and activity so they um, are at less risk for obesity. Um, if they become overweight or obese, that's going to put more stress on joints. So we want to avoid this if at all possible. And then providing family support. So um, making sure that family knows what to do when there's an injury, um, making sure they know how to prevent injuries and baby proofing and making sure the whole environment is safe and how to help the child in terms of managing the disease.
So we're going to be covering childhood cancer uh, pretty much by body system. So in this section, we're going to talk about leukemia, um, and then we'll talk about the other types of childhood cancers within each body system. Um, so I, I like this slide because it shows you the different types of cancer by age. So in children under five, you can see by the pie there that leukemia is the most common. Um, and then in five to nine years, it's still... Um, the most common, but now we're seeing an increase in brain um, and central nervous system types of cancers. Um, and lymphoma becomes more common. Then from 10 to 14 years, we see the incidence of leukemia drop. And it's kind of tied then with, uh, with lymphoma and central nervous system cancers. And then from 15 to 19 years, you can see that, uh, that leukemia risk drops significantly and then we see other types of cancers um, become more common. So it just kind of gives you an idea. So when we're talking about leukemia, we're really most likely focusing on a very young child or a school ager. Okay, let's get into the nitty gritty on leukemia. So it's the most commonly diagnosed cancer in children under the age of 14. And what we see with leukemia is the same as what we see in adults, is that what we have is a proliferation of abnormal white blood cells. So the main types um, of leukemias are acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or ALL, um, and acute myelogenous leukemia, or AML. Um, there are um, some rare, more chronic types of childhood leukemias as well. So um, the ALL... Um, accounts for about 25% of all childhood cancers um, and 78% um, of childhood leukemia. So this is by far the most common. Uh, the peak onset uh, for ALL is two to three years of age, and it's more common in Caucasians and boys. And then AML accounts for about 17% of childhood leukemias. It's most commonly seen in children under the age of two and in our teenagers. It's also more common in males, in Asians, and Pacific Islanders. You know, the etiology or the cause of leukemia is really not well understood. Um, there are some theories or ideas about it. It may be related to infectious agents um, that make the body more vulnerable. Um, there is some genetic factors involved. We know that it's more common with some of the chromosomal abnormalities that we see in children. Um, we, uh, it's, uh, you know, kids with an immunodeficiency are at increased risk for developing leukemia. And we also know that exposure to toxins like, uh, like chemical, chemical agents or radiation can also increase the risk of a child developing leukemia. However, we have kids who develop leukemia that don't have any of these things that we know of. So it's not so much a causative thing, but that we know there um, for some people is a connection. Okay, so for pathophysiology, what happens within the body um, when someone develops leukemia is that the stem cells in the bone marrow um, are producing immature white blood cells that don't function properly. So rather than making, as they're supposed to, normal healthy white blood cells, they're, um, they're putting out these immature ones that don't work right. And then these cells will proliferate rapidly through cloning, not through mitosis. And then these cells will fill the bone marrow and spill into the circulatory system. Um, and, and as this happens, what occurs is they replace normal white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. Um, so the number of normal white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets in circulation is reduced dramatically. Cellular immunity is affected, so they become more vulnerable to infection. Um, it also leads to anemia, abnormal bruising, and bleeding. So um, you may be aware that for, uh, for people um, who are diagnosed with leukemia, what they'll sometimes say is they noticed a lot of bruising and bleeding prior to their diagnosis. So this is something that if we're seeing abnormal levels of bruising on a child, this is kind of a red flag that we want to do some follow-up and work up and see what the heck is going on.
Clinical manifestations for the child with leukemia may include fever, pallor, uh, like episodes of bruising or bleeding, petechiae, uh, lethargy, malaise, just you know, not feeling good, not having good energy, a uh, loss of appetite or anorexia, uh, large joint and bone pain. So if you think about what's going on in the bone marrow, it kind of makes sense that, that the bones would actually hurt. Um, it can lead to hepatosplenomegaly, lymphadenopathy. Uh, they can present with headache, vomiting, and papilledema. And these we're going to see um, if CNS involvement is occurring. Um, and in some cases, um, boys may present with testicular enlargement. Okay, for diagnosis, we're going to look at blood counts. Um, the child with leukemia is going to present with anemia, thrombocytopenia, and neutropenia. So these are things we want to be on the lookout for. We're also going to do a bone marrow biopsy, and what we're going to see is a lot of immature and or abnormal lymphoblasts. Um, and then the other thing we want to look for, because this is all occurring within the bone, we want to look at, uh, um, at calcium, potassium, and phosphorus levels. Treatment for leukemia is going to focus on radiation and chemotherapy. Um, we can do um, hematopoietic stem cell uh, transplant for AML, and um, that can be used on ALL after a relapse during their second remission. So that's not done routinely for ALL until they've um, had a couple of relapses. And the prognosis for leukemia for our low-risk patients or those who don't have any other complications going on, um, we have an up to a 90% survival rate. So pretty impressive, um, you know, uh, like for cancer survival. So that's kind of the good news part. For higher risk patients, the survival rate's about 75 to 80% with our current treatment. So, you know, I've got to say for high risk, that's still a pretty darn good survival rate. And then 15 to 20% of those patients will have a relapse within a year of completing um, their treatment. So it's something we kind of always want to be on the lookout for, and we can't count our eggs before they hatch or assume that we're, you know, that we're in the clear until, um, you know, we've, we, we've reached a couple of milestones without any relapses. Your, uh, your nursing management is going to focus on assessment for the most part. Um, we're watching for signs and symptoms of bleeding, um, like bruising and petechiae. We're monitoring for signs of infection, fever, and like any other signs of infection, of course, will depend on where the infection is, what signs we're looking for. Um, in terms of chemotherapy, we need to monitor renal function, looking at specific gravity, I's and O's, and daily weights. We need to monitor their nutrition. Um, you know, with chemo, of course, we know that can cause severe nausea and vomiting. Um, so we want to make sure they're getting a lot of bang for their buck, so to speak, and making sure they're getting enough protein and really good nutrition. We're also going to monitor for constipation. We want to monitor the oral mucosa for ulcers. We want to watch them for behavioral changes. And we want to do a really good job with pain management, especially um, as it relates to to procedures. So these are kids, if they're getting chemo, they're going to have a porta cath placed most likely. Um, they're going to be in and out of the hospital frequently, lots of doctor visits. So we really want to do whatever we can um, to make sure if we're needing to poke and prod at them that, you know, we're managing pain that's associated with that. In addition, um, we want to also do the following intervention. So um, we want to prevent infection, which is kind of a no-brainer with cancer. So we're going to use our, our transmission-based precautions, good hand hygiene. We're going to monitor temp, do good mouth care, monitor skin for breakdown, and monitor their central line. So this, you know, all related to infection. Um, in terms of kidney function, we're going to watch uh, for hematuria. We want to make sure that they're hydrated with IV fluid. They're, they'll most likely be getting 1.5 times maintenance if they're in the hospital. We want to keep their specific gravity less than 1.010. So we want to keep the spec grav low, which means they're more hydrated. Um, we also want to do an excellent job um, with monitoring eyes and nose and daily weights. Because, of course, that will help us um, to, uh, 
to identify any changes in fluid status. Um, lots of teaching is going to be involved, teaching about medications and side effects, how to administer them, how to, uh, how to recognize that their condition is worsening, when to call the doctor, when to come to the ER, that type of thing. Um, they also need a lot of family support, as you can imagine. Um, to find out that your child's been diagnosed with leukemia is a really scary prospect. So we need to support families and help them with coping, connect them to support groups, um, maybe uh, you know uh, facilitate alternative therapies like uh, like relaxation, guided imagery, um, making sure that they're playing and they're having fun. Um, we can provide music. Um, to make their environment more comfortable, but anything we can do to kind of support the child and the family and make them more comfortable is going to be really helpful. Uh, your education for these families in terms of, um, of chemotherapy, including uh, making sure the child is getting enough rest, um, making sure we're not exposing the child to people who are sick, staying hydrated, um, making sure they're eating a healthy diet, small frequent meals, really good nutrition, following instructions um, for, uh, uh, for medications, making sure they're taking anti-nausea medicine, good oral hygiene, soft toothbrush, um, making sure we're staying out of the sun, um, um, and and reporting any signs of infection or changes in condition right away to the physician. In terms of emotional needs, um, we need to prepare them for some of the stuff that's going to change so that they can prepare themselves emotionally. So um, we need to help them be prepared for loss of hair, plan um, uh, uh, with them if they're going to wear hats, uh, wigs, scarves, things like that. Um, making sure that we're keeping kids as connected to friends as possible, teaching them the relaxation techniques that will help them sleep um, and get through treatments, um, talk with pastors, teachers, parents, whoever we can um, in the child's little sphere um, to help them with coping and provide them with support as well and to help them understand how they can help the family. Um, and we can talk to them about journaling, um, and things that are going to allow them to kind of express those emotions, work through them as they go through treatment. Wilms tumor is also known as a nephroblastoma. Um, this is the most common malignant renal and intra-abdominal tumor of childhood. So it's three times more commonly seen in African American children, and the peak age of diagnosis uh, for Wilms tumor is eight, is, um, is three years of age. So we see this more frequently in males. Um, it favors the left kidney, and we'll talk about in a minute why that is a good thing. Um, and 10% of the cases of Wilms tumor do involve both kidneys, so they can have a tumor on each kidney. And we do know that there um, is possibly a genetic link. So think about the anatomy of the kidney or the, or the body for just a minute and where the kidneys sit um, and where the kidney, the right kidney versus left kidney, how they are situated in the body, and think about why the left kidney um, would be a better choice for a Wilms tumor, and why that would be advantageous to us. Um, and if you think about what is surrounding the left kidney versus the right kidney, the right kidney is um, just behind uh, things that are really vascular, like the liver, um, where on the left side. Uh, the kidney, uh, the position that it sits in, makes it a little bit easier to manipulate and remove and less risk of, you know, nicking arteries um, and causing major complications and bleeding. So if you're going to have a child with a Wilms tumor, we would prefer that they get it in the left side. But, you know, it is what it is. Usually the child who uh, develops a Wilms tumor um, is asymptomatic, so they're not going to really be complaining of anything, um, any pain, any problems, um, and it grows really, really fast. So it's going to double in size in about two weeks' time. So this means it's usually large at time of diagnosis. Um, it's usually that the parents um, are reporting um, that 
they have this abdominal mass is, is what they'll present with. So they don't have any other symptoms. So that's why it's going to be large at diagnosis because we're not going to notice it for any other reason. Uh, for diagnostic evaluation of Wilms tumor, we're looking again for abdominal mass or swelling, and then we're going to confirm diagnosis with ultrasound, CT, or and or MRI. And what we're really looking for here is we're assessing for uh, for metastasis or spread. So um, because it is um, it's it is asymptomatic and grows very quickly. Um, you know, it can be spread. And if you think about, you know, kidney, a tumor in the kidney or cancer in the kidney, the bloodstream is is just, um, you know, the kidney is very vascular. The bloodstream is so close and it's not going to take much for that, uh, for that cancer, for those cells to get into the bloodstream and spread. The most important thing for you to remember as the nurse who's taking care of a patient with the suspected or known Wilms tumor in place is you will never palpate the abdomen, ever, ever, ever. The Wilms tumor is very fragile. Um, it is very easy uh, to break open, um, and it will easily spread uh, cancer cells if um, if it breaks open. So then the, those cancer cells are going to spill out into the abdominal cavity. So we really, really don't want that to happen. Therapeutic management for Wilms tumor is very simple. We're going to do surgery to remove the affected kidney or in some cases both kidneys if they're both affected. Then we'll need to follow that up with chemotherapy and or radiation. Um, some of the nursing considerations to remember is that surgery needs to happen very quickly. So they're going to go to surgery within 24 to 48 hours of diagnosis um, because we need to get that tumor out of there as quickly as possible. Um, if you're caring for this patient, you're going to assess the abdomen in ways that um, are not going to put them at risk. So we're going to check bowel sounds, monitor bowel movements, monitor for nausea, vomiting, and assess for pain. So that doesn't sound like a real incredibly um, thorough um, like abdominal assessment, and it's really not. But we don't want to do anything that could risk uh, uh, damaging or rupturing that tumor. Uh, complications that we usually see with Wilms tumor are related to the drugs, to the medications, um, which can lead to intestinal obstruction, edema, um, adhesions, and infection. So um, the Wilms tumor itself, once we take it out, unless there are METs, um, we don't really have a lot of problems. Um, unless if we're taking out both kidneys, what does that mean for the patient? Yeah, if we're removing both kidneys, they're clearly going to need um, like kidney transplant. And if we can't get them a kidney right away, um, then they're going to need to be on dialysis. Bone and soft tissue tumors. Diagnostic evaluation of, of bone tumors, including osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma, um, are the same. So for both of these, whichever one we might suspect, we're going to rule out trauma or infection first. And then a definitive diagnosis will be based on radiologic studies. So either a CT scan, bone scan, or MRI. We also um, can complete a, a bone or tumor biopsy. Um, and in terms of lab tests that go along with this, um, we'll be looking for an elevated um, ALKFOS um, with some of these bone tumors. The osteosarcoma is the most frequent malignant bone tumor in children. It has a peak incidence during the rapid growth years, so we usually say like 10 to 25 years from a statistical standpoint. Um, most of the primary tumor sites are in the metaphysis of the long bones, especially the legs or the femur. There's a picture on the next slide that'll um, refresh your memory on bone parts and where these locations are exactly. Most occur in the distal femur, the proximal tibia or the proximal humerus. Here's a little refresher on the structure of the long bone. Um, so of course the end is the epiphysis uh, um, on either end and these are where the growth plates 
are at, then just below that is the metaphysis. So it's the area really between the shaft or the diaphysis and the epiphysis. There's a small area there. It's almost like the transitional section of the bone. And remember when we're saying um, like a distal portion of the bone, which will be further from the center of the body and proximal will be closer to the center of the body. So initial symptoms for your osteosarcoma patient um, are going to be a bone pain, swelling, and limp. So the pain may refer to the hip or the back, um, which can delay diagnosis. So they don't always identify pain in the bone of the leg itself. Um, and then in terms of metastasis, many children have met at the time of diagnosis. So this is not uncommon at all for it to have already spread by the time we figure out what's going on. Pulmonary mets occur in about 20% of cases. And if this is the only place that we have a spread of the cancer, then um, we can do a lung resection. And with treatment, um, they can have still a very good prognosis. Once we have metastasis to other sites like the kidneys, adrenal glands, brain, and bone lesions, then their prognosis is going to become worse. So the more sites that we have involved, the poorer their prognosis will be. Therapeutic management is going to include uh, chemotherapy and surgery. The traditional approach was to amputate the affected limb. However, what we're seeing currently um, with technology available is that we're able to perform a limb salvage procedure, which is a resection of the bone with a, with a prosthetic replacement in the affected area. Um, and so in those cases, they will definitely um, need uh, some physical therapy or rehab, rehab after surgery. Um, you know, you know, whether they have the traditional with amputation or the limb salvage, um, they're still going to have to um, do some work to you know, get walking again. In terms of nursing care, one of the most important things is preoperative preparation or education. So we have to be honest with them about the potential outcomes. We have to let them know there's a possibility that they get in there and they're going to have to amputate the limb, even though they you know, maybe are hoping to be able to do a resection. So it's important that we prepare them um, just in case. So they're going to also need support during um, like the adjustment period. Um, to the adjustment of the idea of amputation, uh, to even surgical resection, and to chemotherapy. Think about some of the body image concerns that are going to come along with that. Uh, you know, obviously with the chemotherapy, the loss of hair, you know, things like that, but even scarring, the amputation, um, and the effects of that on body image. We're going to get child life involved to help do education and procedure preparation with this child and help them cope. And then one of the the other most important pieces is pain management. We have to do an effective job in managing pain. Um, we have to remember that they are also at risk for phantom limb pain beyond just like incisional and surgical pain. Um, and just like we do with adults, we can treat that child with phantom limb pain uh, with Elevel. So that is still commonly used in children just as well as adults. Ewing sarcoma is the second most common malignant bone tumor in children and adolescents and is rarely seen over the age of 30. It occurs in 2 and 1 million children and in this case or, uh, with Ewing sarcoma it's going to arise in the bone marrow itself so obviously in the shaft portion of the long bones. Um, most likely places for us to see um, this occur is the femur, the pelvis, the tibia, fibula, the humerus, the scapula, ribs, and clavicle. And don't try to remember all of those locations, but um, in thinking of what we see with osteosarcoma ver uh, you know, versus Ewing sarcoma, there are a lot more um, like potential locations for this to occur um, than we see with osteosarcoma. Symptoms of the child with Ewing sarcoma include pain, swelling, fever, an elevated WBC count, an elevated ESR, and elevated CRP. 
So if you think about the fact that this is a tumor that's occurring within the bone marrow and the surrounding areas of the bone, um, it makes sense that it's going to affect um, our body temperature and our blood counts. So because that's where blood production is occurring right inside the bone marrow. Um, and then we'll see the elevated ESR and CRP because those are, of course, general markers for inflammation. So those don't tell us anything else except we're dealing with inflammation, but um, those along with the suspicion of Ewing sarcoma will help to give us more information or maybe even concern, uh, you, know, uh, you know, confirm that that's what we're dealing with. They may also present to us with a fracture. If you think about how a tumor in the marrow can weaken the strength of that, of that bone, um, it's not uncommon for them to show up with a tumor. Um, we, um, so it's still the gold standard to perform chemotherapy for, um, for reducing the tumor. Um, traditionally, this would have been followed by surgical removal of the entire bone. However, we're now seeing more limb salvage procedures um, you know, being done instead of complete amputation, which is really exciting. There's even a new procedure called a rotation plasty, where they take out the affected joint. So let's say it's in um, the lower femur. So instead of taking away the entire lower leg, um, they're going to take out that section that's affected. So they'll take out that jo joint and lower part um, of the of the femur that's affected. Um, while salvaging the lower portion of the leg and foot that's not affected, then they'll reattach the lower leg to the thigh bone um, backward, allowing the ankle to act as a knee joint. And then we can use that foot on backward um, to place it in a prosthetic device and allows kids to stay really, really active. I mean, it's like crazy exciting to see these things. Um, and you'll see a picture of that on the next slide. Um, and the other thing that's important to know about Ewing sarcoma is the prognosis is best if there's no metastasis at time of diagnosis. However, metastasis are almost always present with Ewing sarcoma. So we see METs very, very frequently in these children at time of diagnosis. Here you can see what the rotation plasty looks like. Um, I kind of have the picture stacked on the left and then go over to the right to kind of look at the outcome. So it's a really interesting procedure. The nursing care management for the child uh, with Ewing sarcoma includes assisting the family in dealing with the diagnosis. We need um, to be aware of infection risk and take measures to prevent infection. Um, we need to remember the body image concerns that we're going to have um, with this as well, um, and mobility concerns. Managing complications um, in chemotherapy, so like hair loss, nausea, vomiting, um, all of that type of thing. And nutritional concerns. Of course, we know they're going to be immunocompromised with chemotherapy, so we need to make sure that they're getting good nutrition um, and they have what they need for healing, especially if undergoing surgery. So we're not going to really talk about brain tumors themselves. Um, it, 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 there's just not a good reason to spend uh, too much time on that. But I do want to mention um, one neurotumor that, um, that is fairly common in children, and it's called the neuroblastoma. So the neuroblastoma is the most common malignant extracranial solid tumor of childhood. So that means that it occurs outside of the head. So it's outside the cranium. So, it, uh, so it'll develop anywhere along the sympathetic nervous system chain. So typical locations would be the abdomen, the, uh, the adrenal glands, the thoracic cavity, and cervical area. So, and it's very common for metastasis to have already occurred before diagnosis is made. Most of the time we'll see neuroblastoma uh, before the age of 10, and it's called a silent tumor because 70% of cases are going to be diagnosed after metastasis, which is really um, not, not very encouraging.
So for the child with a neuroblastoma, the objective is to locate the primary site of the tumor and sites of any metastasis or METs. Um, we're, so the signs and symptoms depend on the location of the tumor and the stage of the disease. So how big is the tumor? Where is it located? Um, that will determine signs and symptoms. So it's in, extremely variable. Um, we're going to look at radiologic studies, do uh, a bone marrow evaluation potentially, um, and we're going to do biopsies. Um, and that'll allow us to complete tumor markers um, and figure out um, what type of staging um, you know, we're dealing with, how, how advanced is the tumor um, and the cancer, so we can come up with an effective treatment plan. Um, we'll likely do surgery to remove the tumor um, at the time we obtain biopsies. We don't want to let it sit there any longer than necessary, so they're going to go in and get it all cleaned out. Um, then we're going to follow up uh, with radiation and chemotherapy. Uh, they may be candidates for bone marrow transplant and stem cell rescue as well. So for our low-risk patients, they have about an 88 to 90 percent survival rate at five years from diagnosis, which is pretty darn good if you think about it. Those are pretty good odds. But as soon as they have any metastasis or um, like any other uh, type of uh, comorbidity that will increase them or make them more high risk, then our survival rate drops to somewhere between 22 and 30 percent. So then um, we become much more concerned. And since we already know that METs are very oftentimes going to be present at time of diagnosis, um, that is very concerning. Um, and in general, the rule of thumb is the younger they are at time of diagnosis, the better uh, their chances of survival are.